So welcome to you all uh, to this Pathways Forum on communicating messy science. So for those of you who are new to the Pathways Forum, this webinar series is part of uh, the Pathways Initiative, which is a, an initiative by Future Earth, which was created in order to support researchers uh, interested in or already engaging in transformative approaches uh, to sustainability science. And so this means supporting researchers' capacity to engage in transdisciplinary work, uh, to provide spaces such as this webinar series to, uh, to reflect uh, on the implications on the challenges, but also on the sources of joy and hope, hopefully, uh, that can come from bridging the gap between science and society and from contributing to societal transformations on the ground. But in an academic system that is not exactly designed to reward this type of uh, approach to research, we also feel that it's part of the Pathways Initiative role to give more visibility to projects that are not afraid to tackle complex problems in, uh, in concrete contexts by working with actors in processes of knowledge co-production and, and pathways co-design. And this is why the Pathways Communication Grants Program was created. And you will hear uh, more about this program later in the session. But with this, our goal um, was that uh, we can increase the visibility and reach uh, of, uh, of those types of approaches and increase uh, their, their, their legitimacy, uh, essentially, and, uh, and their recognition in the institutions. And of course, communication and transformative projects such as uh, developing a common narrative uh, goes beyond a matter simply of visibility. Uh, once we consider the transformative potential of communication and outreach and how it can really be an extension, a structural ele element, and maybe sometimes also a destabilizing element in a transdisciplinary project. And this is really on those aspects that uh, today's session will focus on the transformative potential of communication and the implications that it can have on uh, uh, working on a transdisciplinary context. Now, if you have been following the Pathways Initiative for a while, you surely already know uh, my colleague Natalie Chong, who, amongst other things, coordinates the, the Pathways Communication Grants Program. And given her role, it seemed quite evident uh, that Natalie would be the ideal person to lead uh, to this session. So I am pleased uh, to pass my virtual microphone to you, Natalie, to take over. Thank you, Jim, and thank you very much to our panelists. We're very excited to have you here with us today to share your experiences and be able to dive deeper into navigating the different challenges and the different opportunities of communicating transdisciplinary research from different perspectives and share some of the insights that you've gained. Um, so just a quick note on the format of the session, we will have um, short presentations from our panelists. Then I will have some questions um, that I will ask them, and then we will open up the discussion um, to everyone in the room to ask your questions, share your own experiences, uh, make comments, uh, that sort of thing. And if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to write them in the chat already, and we will uh, be taking note of them for the discussion portion. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our first uh, speakers which are Kia Smith and Daniel Cruz Lopez from the University of Queensland, who will give us a taste of their work on the Fair Food Futures project. Over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie, and thank you everyone for having us. Um, my name is Dr. Kia Smith, and also joining us is Daniel Cruz Lopez, who also worked really closely with me on this project. So just give me a second, and I'm going to share my screen, and then I'm just going to make sure um that we can all see hopefully you can all see that yeah and I'll just make sure sorry let me just make sure that the sound is on yeah okay sure it should be fine so um hopefully also I'll get to do this in 10 minutes for you so thanks very much um our project is called Fair Food Futures and um as I said my name is Dr Keir Smith and I'm pleased to present a summary of our research today and how we've been translating this into communication products that meet the aims of the project to engage more closely with civil society narratives for the future of food justice in the context of the sustainable development goals. There we go. Uh, before I go further, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work, the Turrbal and Yagara owner, uh, traditional owners. 
So on behalf of the University of Queensland, I wish to pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. Also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. So beginning in 2019, we here at UQ have been conducting a National Australian Research Council funded study to explore the ways in which Australian community food networks envisage and work towards a more just and sustainable food system. So in our study, we engage, engage close to 100 participants from community food networks. So that means small scale producers, alternative distributors, community gardeners and food charity representatives in interviews and participatory workshops with the aim of co-creating community-led visions of food justice in Australia. So we asked people, what does your fair food future look like and how do we get there? And this research was driven by one very simple truth about food system transformation, that in order to build a better future, we must first be able to imagine ourselves there. So the visions, and, and we, we really took the starting point, that the visions that people hold for the future of food form the basis for our individual actions, collective action and collaboration, and they shape, enable and constrain governance and policy making in this space. And these visions are also strongly contested with business, government, industry and civil society all holding very different perspectives and capacities to affect change. So what is the topic of this project? Fair Food Futures aim to co-create future scenarios that have local participation and food justice at the core. We really asked how do community food networks influence the kind of wider paradigm shift towards sustainability that the 2030 agenda and food justice requires. So here are the four main aims in kind of the academic project sense. But through this, you can see that what we were aiming to do is to really contribute to civic food networks, movements themselves and their efforts to transport transform food systems in Australia, as well as to inform global conversations about how the goals of zero hunger, as they're articulated in the SDGs, might be mobilised more effectively at the local and national scale. And we wanted to do that by listening to the lessons and visions provided by grassroots community food networks across the country. So we use futures thinking or future scenarios narratives about the future that can help communities, governments and other stakeholders better understand and prepare for upcoming changes and can help to identify present actions that work towards a desired future. So it was very much grounded in what we can see already happening now in the civic food space to think about kind of more utopian food futures. So in that sense, Fair Food Futures was both a local initiative and a part national research project with a key goal being able to enable a more inclusive discussion about what a fair and just food system could and should look like. So the research has been led by myself, um, but I also had a skilled team with me at UQ, um, Daniel Cruz, who's here with us tonight, um, Joanna Horton as well, who was a PhD student on the study. So um, we had um, a mixed sample of people. These are some just a snapshot of some of, our, of the participants in the study. So it was over 100 participants. I think it was more around 130 at the moment. Um, we they represented a wide range of civic food networks and actors and sectors. They were located across the country um, and all participants gave their verbal consent to participate in this co-creation of the research. And since the initial project started and the initial kind of data collection and co-creation of scenarios, some of these participants have also directly been part of our communications outputs that we've developed through the Future Earth Pathways Communication Grant. And here, um, this participatory research design tries to contribute new understandings of transformation pathways civil society participation, which has to date been quite low in SDGs and other themes that the SDGs haven't really included, such as food justice. So the project resulted in the creation of four complementary fair food futures and associated pathways to action based on food justice. So I don't have time to go into these here, but what we did through the Pathways Grant is we created an animation and a podcast to take these, bring these findings to life. So you can find um, more information about the scenarios themselves on our website. Um, but we had four scenarios, 
The Long Table, Fair Food in the City, Youth Food and Climate Action and Technology for the People, which you can see there on the right. And they've all been illustrated um, with where we were working with a um, permaculture educator and illustrator right through the project. Um, and then these futures are connected by four pathways to transformative action. And these um, were really referred these refer to those changing mindsets and practices in ways that align with core concepts of justice. So in our project, we termed these intersectional solidarity and care, food and rights for all, food systems as a common good, and resilience beyond crisis. So again, I won't go into what all of these mean, because these are findings of the project, but these were used to structure the animation and also the podcast. So, why did it seem important to communicate it about it in these formats? So we really focused on imagining, co-creating, experimenting and materialising these pathways for sustainability and food justice. The outputs needed to simplify these messages to a diverse civic public to ensure that the discussions and decisions about the future of food systems and the SDGs do not remain confined to academic industry and government. So we created an, an animation first based on our illustrations, and this raised awareness for how Australian community food networks envisage a more sustainable and just food future and emphasised the key role that civil society can play. And then the podcast facilitated further spaces of dialogue through which civil society could share their own discourses, strategies, successes and limitations as they aim to create these food futures. So a little bit more on why we thought it was important. I wanted uh, to let Brenna Quinlan speak about that a little bit. So I'm going to play the video now. And this was the person that we worked with on the illustrations and the animation. This project has been so exciting and when I first came on I was actually gathering um, the thoughts from different focus groups and showing them through illustration and then we had this idea to bring that to life at that extra level through the animation side of things and the magic of what these groups are coming up with is that these are solutions to food insecurity to food poverty to food injustice uh, that aren't always spoken about as being solutions. Now, they're solutions that are quite common. They're happening all over the place. They're probably happening in your town, in your neighbourhood, in your street, even in your home. But they're not always seen by policymakers and those with top-down um, thinking, top-down potential as being scalable or applicable. So through this project, we're actually celebrating those common sense, uh, easy to do, creative, exciting community ground up initiatives and shining a real spotlight on those. And they look different um, depending on where you are, they're context dependent, but they're a huge leap forward in how, in, in sort of a, forming a toolkit for uncertain futures as far as food systems go. So that's what drew me to this project is what made it such a joy to work on. It's what made the diversity of voices so exciting to illustrate. And then with the animation to really bring this knowledge to life and show what that looks like uh, was a, an extra level again. Illustration and animation are so inherently shareable in today's connected world. You can put one image out there and overnight millions of people will see it. So the reach of these sorts of media is, is really unparalleled. Um, and so we're, we're, the aim, therefore, is to, to bring bigger audiences and also new audiences who aren't really necessarily thinking about food justice in this way to an awareness of these issues. And hopefully they'll share it on if they like what we're saying. Okay, so I'll leave Brenda there. She talks a little bit more and you can see the full video on the website if you want to hear more from Brenna about the project. Um, so um, I guess finally then, um, how is this expected to contribute to transformation? And I thought about this for some time and I, I mean, I think first um, I see the purpose of research translation here as one where new stories are brought together in ways that encourage new alliances to form. 
So our podcast and animation sit alongside our academic and policy facing outputs as a means to translate storytelling about real food utopias in ways that are theoretically and empirically informed, but also in ways that encourage joint exploration of pathways for sustainability. And this is based on people's own experiences and the grassroots initiatives themselves. So here you can see um, the seven episodes of the podcast that we develop. And each one um, was developed to not only provide a platform for dialogue and sharing of the findings themselves, but it was also a way to strengthen alliances between the community food networks and the wider publics. So the topics for each episode were organized around one of the transformative pathways defined in the project with, an introdu with two introductions and one kind of conclusion episode that put these in their local and global context. So in those, we defined food justice, we looked at it in global historical perspective, and we connected the practical examples along the way with key questions about food policy making both in Australia and internationally. So through this, we think that this Fair Food Futures um, project overall has really been um, really um, an exciting and creative and hopeful way to enable a more inclusive discussion about what a fair and just food system should look like in Australia with lessons not only for Australia, but for civic networks around the world. So I want to quickly pay, uh, play you a really quick clip from the podcast. And again, you can hear this and see it on the website. This is the Fair Food Futures podcast. What would a fair food system look like? And how do we get there? By sharing real life stories about food justice in Australia, we'll showcase some exciting pathways for transforming food systems from the ground up. You know, food prices now are higher than they were during the 2008 food price. You know, inequity is intrinsic to capitalism. If I could, I would love to see market gardens in every suburb. Diversity is actually the big word in resilience in food grain. Who are we not inviting to the table for change? The justice comes not in surviving the system, but in fact, justice comes through transformation of systems of power. The heart and the energy and the soul of transformation comes from people. It comes from below. It's important to build convergence among local movements. Welcome to the first episode of the Fair Food Futures podcast. This is a podcast exploring the stories of grassroots organisations working towards a fairer food system in Australia and the strategies, challenges and opportunities they encounter. By exploring these stories, we ask a bigger question. What does it mean to do food justice in Australia today? This podcast was recorded on Jagger and Turrbal land, and we acknowledge the traditional owners and their ongoing connection to country. The podcast draws on research funded by an Australian Research Council Discovery Early Career Award and has received financial support from the Future Earth Pathways Initiative. Thanks, everyone. I'll leave it there. I look forward to seeing the other presentations as well and uh, chatting more about it in the discussion. Thank you very much, Kia. That was really great. And for anyone that wants to watch the video, listen to the podcast, my colleague Stephanie has put uh, the link to the Fair Food Futures project in the chat, so you can check that out. Um, so next, we will take a trip to Uruguay with Ignacio Gianelli from the University of Santiago de Compostela, who will speak about his project, Fishing Transformations. Over to you, Ignacio. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, I will start sharing my screen. I hope by now you will be able to see my presentation. Let me know if, if you can see it. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much uh, for your introduction. In this presentation, I will share our experience of producing filming and launching a short film entitled Fishing Transformations, Portraits of Innovation in Small-Scale Fishes, which was supported by the Pathways Communication Grant of Future Earth. Um, throughout the presentation, I will briefly explain the broader transdisciplinary project in which this particular short film is embedded, trying to highlight the key role of communication for enabling transformative pathways. So the film is embedded in the Fishing Transformation Project, which consists in a transdisciplinary co-creation process that ultimately aims to enable sustainability transformation in small-scale fishes in Uruguay. The project is much more than a science-driving project. It's about collaboratively finding innovative, creative, 
and inclusive pathways towards desirable futures. And to do this, we brought together sustainability initiatives like, for example, family-based enterprises, local projects, fishing associations or, or cooperatives, all the way from fishing to consumption and beyond, including also researchers and artists to assemble a coalition of factors pushing the limits of innovation in small-scale fisheries. And two of the main objectives of these projects were to co-create desirable, meaningful, and plural visions of the future, and also initiating a transformative space for small-scale fisheries. This means a collaborative environment where actors and can dialogue and experiment with the new mental models, ideas, and practices. Uh, we thought that the project will, will leverage the agency of innovative initiatives, the creative and disruptive capacity of artists, and also the role of scientists that includes uh, having the time and space to analyze sustainability issues and also building a network that facilitates the whole process. So one of the pillars of fishing transformation project is indeed communication because we rapidly understood that in order to engage all the sustainability initiatives participating in the project, it would necessary it would be necessary to think in project outputs that would be beneficial for all and also compatible with the group diversity. This means trying to finding a common ground and we found that common ground in communication. So we came up with the idea of focusing on communication activities and products with a twofold purpose. Firstly, using communication pieces as a boundary ob objects to connect actors and also knowledge systems and secondly, to give a visibility platform to the initiatives by illuminating their contribution to positive changes. But well before participating in Pathcom Pathway Communication Grant, we had done some other communication um, efforts, for example, uh, some online dialogues and also a catalog that portrays all the participating initiatives in the project. But for the Pathway Communication Grant, we wanted to go one step further, and then we developed this short film to show the ongoing process we were navigating at that time, which was envisioning a desirable future and setting a space for collaboration. So the short film that is available on Equal C Lab and Sarah's Institute YouTube channels summarizes in less than 25 minutes, the experiences and personal history of several sustainability initiatives throughout uh, Uruguay and uh, in, in different social ecological contexts where small scale fishing occurs in, in this country, but also our process of co-creating desirable futures together with small scale fisheries, gastronomes, artists, and researchers. This short film was created thanks to the, a large group of people. Uh, here I'm only presenting uh, a subset of all the people that participate in, in the production and filming of the short film. But I think that I'm, I'm strongly convinced that two of the key factors for the success of the film were the diversity of backgrounds of those involved but also the fact that we created time and space for every project participants. This means gastronomes, fishers, processors, and many others to provide inputs and ideas into the narrative and storyline of the film. So at this point, I would like to share a very short glimpse of the short film. En tiempos de cambios y transformaciones, es necesario imaginar formas sostenibles de producir alimentos. La pesca ha sido desde siempre fuente de sustento y vida para la humanidad. Esta es una breve historia de diversos proyectos innovadores llevados adelante por comunidades de pesca artesanal que habitan las costas y ríos del Uruguay. Con el apoyo de científicos, cocineros, emprendedores, instituciones y actores sociales, se innova, se piensan y se ensayan nuevas prácticas. 
estas son semillas de cambio, desde donde imaginar formas de vida sustentables a largo plazo, en armonía con la naturaleza. So, how does all this contribute to the transformation we were seeking to enable? So, I think that overall, the short film is about shaping a new narrative about the future of small-scale fisheries. But to me, this has two key main functions. First, act as a social glue for the participants of the project, which creates a solid ground for collective action. And two, it conveys an optimistic vision that is meaningful for participants in their specific context. Um, and all the different communication pieces along the project, and particularly this short film, made it possible for this vision to move beyond our inner circle and reach a broader audience and other actors. And I think uh, this really scales up our impact. So one concrete thing we did uh, to break out the boundaries of this uh, inner circle was to organize a big launching event uh, once the short film was ready. This event included national and local governmental actors, for example, ministries, the fishery management agency, FAO officers, and other fishing communities, researchers, and many more. And we strongly believe that the event was instrumental to make engagement opportunities more visible to new actors, but also to raise this, the voice of several actors of the food system linked to small scale fisheries who often struggle to find a platform to express their opinions, concerns, and propose alternatives. And one thing that we did during those launching events uh, was to make sure that we were not talking at people but two people that was uh, that we, so the way we try to do this is to engage them into a reflection exercise where they could share thoughts, emotions, or memories that were evoked by, short, by the short film. So uh, moreover, people could also chat directly with the project participants and through that, people were not left hanging, but could really connect with this history. And if in the case you don't speak Spanish, the two most frequently used words to describe the short uh, film by the, by the uh, attendees of these launching events were future and hope. So Thank you very much for your attention. It has been a real, real pleasure. I want to acknowledge the collaboration of all project participants and special thanks to my closest group of collaborators at SARS Institute and the Equal Sea Lab. And of course, thank you. Uh, thanks to Future Earth for supporting our project and investing in opportunities for communicating trans the transdisciplinary work of many PhD students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ignacio. And for anyone who wants to find out more about the Fishing Transformations Project, the link is in the chat. There's also a link to the short film on YouTube. So next, I will hand it over to Melina Macron from the French National Center for Scientific Research, uh, who will take us on a journey to Senegal. Uh, is or are we? Uh, <laughs> So, Lina, um, you're taking us to Senegal, I believe, to talk about your project, Inspire and Embark. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk today about the communication in the frame of the RGO project. The RGO project uh, is funded by the Belmont Forum, and uh, we have we obtained a grant, uh, a communication grant from future, from future obtained by Claire Dutre, a PhD candidate in, in our project. Uh, the team involved today is really large with researchers, artists, fab lab, uh, stakeholders, the municipality, and citizens. Uh, we will focus today on the on a case study of the project in Senegal, in the city of Silicotan. Sebikotan is a 45 
kilometers from Dakar, the capital of Senegal. And the, in Africa, the urbanization is growing very rapidly. And over the ten, past 10 years, uh, the rural village that uh, comprise, um, cons constitutes Sebikotan evolved now into a big city that will soon be considered a, a, a suburb of uh, Dakar, the capital. Residents now complain that the air is becoming increasingly polluted. Indeed, they breathe dust from the desert, particles from road traffic, from kitchen activities, but also here yeah, and they complain about particles from metal recycling plants. Uh, indeed, in this space, uh, there is a lead battery recycling plants and two iron steel uh, recycling plants. So the, the overall the aim of the project is to find a way to empower citizens to transform their environment and to be able to face uh, the, the metal recycling, recycling activity that will continue to increase in the future year. So um, at the beginning of the project in January 2022, we did um, a 10-day residency in Silicon at the heart of the city. And we designed, we made and distributed uh, uh, um, almost uh, 200 uh, biosensors, passive sensors to made uh, of bark of eucalyptus uh, to monitor the, the hair and the particles in the ambient hair. So here with um, scientists, volunteers, a local chief, students, women in charge of community health, we met to discuss to how to implement this transdisciplinary approach in this territory. A key aspect of this residency was the presence of artists and that uh, really fostered the communication uh, at this first stage. This was uh, followed by insert interdisciplinary study to study the biosensor six months later and to involve in ethnographic anthropology and pollution evaluation. So the question now is how to share at this stage of the results, how to share the results, how the, uh, this communication will contribute to transformation for this territory. So um, first I have to say we, we were concerned uh, six months ago about how to fund uh, this sharing of a result, because that uh, when we wrote the project, we hadn't measured the extent, the extent of this need, um, and we felt finally that the restitution, the sharing of the result, should uh, should have a more comprehensive dimension than just lectures or talks. So Claire uh, here uh, obtained a, a communication grant from Future to finance uh, a mobile. Uh, exhibition. I will talk about that later. And this finally enabled us to, to be fully involved in this event with the help of the municipality, uh, a stakeholder in the project. Then another stakeholder, uh, Kert uh, managed to get funding from the High Ridge Fund uh, Foundation and managed to organize a concert. He, he did hear Omar Penn accepted to give a, a free concert uh, for our project. And Omar Penn is uh, one of uh, Senegal's best known singers and is really committed in, to environmental causes. So the, the result that was a snowball effect. Finally, after that, officials at national and local le level accepted invitation to come and uh, local metal industry gave funding or practical help. It was the first time in the project that the metal working industry Enter the, the circle uh, and, and dialogue with us. So this really encouraged stakeholder commitment with us. So, so our aim was not just to share the results evidently, but to ensure that the communication contributes to transformation. So for that, we designed a festival forum for imagining uh, together desirable futures for this territory. So a festival with many ingredients, so why? So to go further, the simple denunciation of environmental pollution uh, or just sharing results. So what are the ingredients? So first the exhibition, I will uh, uh, present that later to share, really share the results. Uh, uh, forum, theater, play, um, 
panel discussion on hair on, on reforestation process. Uh, group discussion uh, in a format that uh, enables participants to meet and express their set despite differences in hierarchy or gender. Um, we, we invite also uh, inviting uh, inspiring examples to, uh, to uh, system imagination to find uh, solutions and to plot your that in evidently the concept. Uh, so the expected outcome of this festival, of this forum festival, is an official statement of what could be new pathway for the territory. But uh, in early June, uh, so what was planned in June, and in early June, a violent demonstration took place in Dakar on a scale never, never seen before in Senegal. So all public events were cancelled, and finally we have to reschedule the event for uh, November uh, 2023. But uh, however, we were finally able to carry out the overall part of the community uh, process, which uh, was to go to the health of the district that have been instrumented during the projects with the exhibition Inspire and Embark. So the exhibition has been designed to move as close as possible to the inhabitant. Um, to be installed in the district square, where never before has a cultural or scientific exhibition been offered. So uh, the exhibition features uh, 19 posters on a mobile structure, easy to move, uh, with uh, data visualization to translate uh, scientific data made by Heva Vedel designer here. So uh, to um, uh, to accompany that, uh, the exhibition also comprises uh, four objects on table, uh, interactive objects, uh, uh, to create a more concrete experience. For, for example, uh, map, uh, maps are really difficult to, to uh, understand uh, just on poster, so uh, are very, very difficult to grasp. So uh, we did a 3D maps uh, that uh, it can allow you to touch touch the wood, touch the relief, understand where you live, where the pollution is in, in a concrete example that you can touch. So these objects uh, really encourage discussion between the team and visitor and between among the visitors. And the last element of the exhibition is a height meter longer mural, uh, a narrative mural designed as a device for sharing stories. Is, it is based on stories co-built in the field uh, and the stories of the project. Scenes here are sufficiently vague for the uh, visitor to be able to project themselves into them and recognize themselves. And in turn, visitors tell st new stories not foreseen by the mural. Uh, the mural also contains uh, height uh, sound pods uh, that you can uh, uh, listen with a QR code. Um, so for, for the entire exhibition, mediation plays a very important role. You can see here uh, two mediators. We, uh, 10 to uh, 15 mediators were involved. Uh, they are young volunteers, students, and local residents. And they are really key for the linguistic and cultural translation. Uh, they appropriate the data and ethics of the project and pass them on uh, to the visitor in their own way. And this is really important for us. Uh, in each district, uh, a part of the exhib exhibition was brought. Uh, a 20 minutes video was shown. Uh, I don't have time to show you it uh, today. And completed by a forum theater piece. The forum theater plays uh, um, has an important role at the end because it, it's uh, able to mock the researcher, mock the village key, mock the inhabitant. And this open really opens the ensuing debate uh, that um, took place in Egypt Street. So let me show you the, the general ambience uh, uh, of this um, exhibition at the heart of the district with uh, um, 102,000 
200 persons each time, each night, and with the help of uh, 10 uh, to uh, 15 mediators or policy debtors. So in summary, the communication in our project uses a lot of different medias and it aims to translate, connect, empower, um, and at, at the first stage of the project, I really thought that uh, uh, we had a strong relationship with stakeholders, with inhabitants. But finally, this, uh, this events, uh, this communication work uh, takes the, this relationship uh, between the players uh, one step further, stronger threats and stronger connection. And I really hope it will pave the way, and I'm sure it will pave the way for this festival in November uh, to imagine future transformation and new pathway for, uh, for this territory and to be able to be an example, so inspiring example for, for Hover. Um, finally, I put here the long list of people you made it. Uh, this communication work possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melina. And it's always difficult to anticipate uh, different political processes that might hinder your plans, but I'm glad that you were able to get some things done and I look forward to um, the exhibition in November. So next we have Juan Salazar from Western Sydney University who will wrap up our little tour around the world in 43 minutes uh, with his project on Antarctic cities. Over to you, Juan. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, can you see my slide there? Yes. Yep. Hello, everyone. And first of all, my sincere apologies to Melina for trying to <laughs> jump the queue and present before you. My, my sincere apologies, I just misunderstood. Uh, thank you for this invitation. Um, I'm Juan Salazar. I'm a professor of media and environment at Western Sydney University in Australia. I am also the chair of Future Earth Australia Steering Committee. I'm joining you this evening from Darug country in Parramatta in Western Sydney. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this project called Antarctic Cities. Rethinking the Gateways, which happened between 2016 and 2021. Um, so it wrapped up about uh, two years ago, and it was funded by the Australian Research Council through a linkage project in collaboration with these local government um, uh, organizations from uh, five cities, uh, Hobart in uh, Australia, Christchurch in New Zealand, Punta Arenas in Chile, Ushuaia in Argentina, and Cape Town in South Africa. I'll start a little bit with the concept that was um, underpinning the whole project uh, and the way how we brought together local government and stakeholders to the project. Uh, most of the cities, um, historically, their heritage has a very similar narrative of cities at the bottom of the world, at the bottom of the planet, at the bottom of South America, at the bottom of Africa. So we wanted to put Antarctica at the center and how the cities are central um, in this you know, change of perspective. Hobart, Christchurch, Punta Arenas, Ushuaia, and Cape Town are at the center of the world if we turn the world around and put Antarctica in the middle. So what, what, what we wanted to do instead of looking at um, the cities as gateways, as they are usually called, gateways to the Antarctic, uh, this is how other countries go to Antarctica through these gateways, is how the cities can reimagine themselves, their urban practices and imaginaries as custodial cities and embed ideas of custodianship within their urban sustainability planning. Uh, of course, um, these ideas of custodianship uh, were inspired uh, from a range of First Nations um, philosophies and approaches to custodianship of country, of land, of oceans, of waters. And part of it was also how to support a uh, interlinked uh, link or network of, of cities. Um, it's not, yep. Um, the city, some of the cities had already uh, been working with these uh, concepts of custodianship. 
For example, the Christchurch uh, City Council through their Antarctic office had already been uh, running a series of consultations with Maori iwi around the notion of kaitikitanga, the idea of custodianship. Um, so we um, embedded uh, those work in our project. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that uh, the project was uh, had a whole communication strategy, but not only as outreach. And one of the take home messages that I wanted to share today is that um, never to think of communication just as dissemination of outreach, but included from the very beginning of the project. Uh, and in our case, we include it as method as well. So some of the things that we did was engage with a range of expert stakeholders from local governments, private sector, uh, we uh, did workshops in the five cities with over 200 of these Antarctic and urban experts to develop urban sustainability profiles uh, with this uh, level of expertise and to develop indicators to develop an Antarctic connectivity index so the cities could use it uh, not to compete uh, uh, among themselves, but to showcase how they are connected to the Antarctic in very meaningful ways across ecological, political, cultural, and economic ways. We also uh, drafted a charter of principles for Antarctic cities, and we conducted um, two surveys, um, online surveys, uh, the second one using AI algorithms uh, to um, interview uh, 1500 people plus in the five cities. But where I want to focus today is in um, in the youth engagement and uh, the uh, which we did through two main projects. One was developing an online series game called the Antarctic Futures Game, which was developed through co-designed workshops with over 100 local youth in the five cities, which collaborated with ideas and ways to develop the game. The game was only developed uh, to a beta uh, stage for, you know, it's quite expensive to develop uh, more sophisticated games. And we also developed an Ant Antarctic Cities Youth Expedition where we uh, invited five youth representatives, which were selected through a competitive process from the five cities. We spent a month in the Antarctic Peninsula um, at the uh, Chilean Research Station. And there we launched an Antarctic uh, Youth Coalition, which is operating in five cities. Uh, there was a total of 25 researchers from humanities, arts, social sciences, many disciplines, but also many disciplines from STEM, from science, technology, and engineering, oceanography, marine biology, sociology, geography, software studies, film, uh, and the, the, the project um, was um, guided by principles of the Athena Swan Char Charter of Gender Equality. So you have a little bit of a breakdown there of where people were based. Uh, we had people from Pakistan and from the six uh, countries that I just mentioned. This is a little bit how the, uh, we also did uh, children's events um, for um, children under 12. This is how the urban sustainability profiles worked. So each of the cities had uh, this graph showing sustainability, uh, urban sustainability across four domains. And this is where we try to insert a new kind of urban imaginary about custodianship of the Antarctic. I'm going to just uh, change now to the website, uh, which you can see there in your chat. Um, two traditional modes of disseminating knowledge that we use were articles in the conversation, uh, which is an important media outlet. Uh, they have had over 50,000 readers, so uh, two summaries were there uh, for general public to more or less follow what the project was about. And the game uh, was developed in English and in Spanish. As I said, developed a co-designed with 100 youth from the five cities and I'll show you a little um
anyway, you get a gist. Uh, the game was inserted in curriculum in schools in some of the cities uh, for teachers to use um, when they were teaching about Antarctica, uh, together with other kind of material about you know penguins and expeditions and icebergs. But this was a good way for uh, youth between uh, 14 and 17 uh, to get a sense of uh, the scientific scenarios and modeling, um, but also some of the policy um, challenges ahead. Uh, during the Antarctic Youth Expedition of one week in the Antarctic, um, we, with the five youth selected from each city, we developed uh, the youth coalition. So they came up with this vision and this mission. They develop a strat strategic overview. Um, and while they operate as a global coalition, they also have their own coalitions within each of the cities. And the coalition in Punta Arenas now has acquired a legal personhood, so they are operating as a, a legal organization. Uh, this is, you know, the group in the Antarctic, and I'll show you a little bit uh, about them. Speaker. experience can be summed up in one word, <laughs> cold. <laughs> it's really cold here. Um, a lot of people have been saying Antarctica has been warming up and the, the summer is one of the warmest summers they've have ever had, but I'm from a tropical country, so <laughs> it's still very cold. <laughs> que terminábamos de cruzar el Drake y aparecían los glaciares, eh, es una sensación indescriptible. Make people realize how connected we are to this continent because people will only protect what they love and they only protect what they know. So we need, to, we need to inspire people to learn more about this continent because that's the first step to, to protecting Antarctica's future. Coming together to form the coalition is important because we cannot wait around for adults to make decisions for us. We need to come together as a youth and um, kind of make an army for the protection of our continent, of our wide continent. I siento que nosotros como jóvenes de las cinco puertas de entrada vamos a ser el agente de cambio que la Antártica necesita. Vamos a trabajar para eso, para entregar el mensaje. Uh, anyways, you get also a snapshot of the project. The video was uh, made by uh, Florencia, who was the representative of the ambassador from um, Ushuaia in Argentina. Uh, I think it's important, again, to um, say that these uh, elements of the project were not uh, thought of or designed within the research design only as outreach and dissemination, but were instrumental methods, participatory action and experimental methods of engagement uh, through which the research was possible. And some of those ideas were captured in this uh, recent um, article, journal article, that was published with the five youth representatives and some of the researchers 
where we unpack a little bit what we meant by the Antarctic Youth Coalition, not just as an outreach strategy, but as an experiment um, in citizen participation and use it, using the experience of this event as a kind of South-South cultural diplomacy. Um, I could, you know, extend a little bit more, but I think I'll stop here. Um, the other part of the uh, project was a more sociological uh, understanding of residents' perceptions of the connection to the Antarctic, um, a, range, a, a, a range of indicators, and some very important uh, information came through about the role of science ar around the world, uh, the, the role of culture uh, and the role of sustainability playing uh, within this urban imaginary that these five cities are trying to construct. The project lives on in many ways. Um, it has had a delayed impact as well. Uh, there is a planned meeting of the five mayors this year in Hobart. Uh, to try to implement some of the charter of the principles of Antarctic cities that we developed for them, as well as to pay attention to how to support the youth coalition uh, in, in many ways. So I'll stop it here. Um, it's a five year project that I could go in any different direction. So thank you for the invitation to share with you and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Juan. Games are always a great way to connect with youth, and I'm sure that my nephews would be very interested in playing uh, that game. And it's very interesting to see such diverse projects, not only in terms of topic, but content and context, but also the type of communication methods and products that were used and the type of the level of creativity that's involved. And I wonder if um, each of you could take a few minutes to tell us from your experience, how does communicating about transdisciplinary research differ, uh, differ from communicating about traditional research? What are the different challenges or the different opportunities um, that are present in each case? And how does that influence the type of communication tools or methods or dissemination strategies that can be used? Does anyone want to start? Hi, Natalie. Yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in. Uh, so from the Fair Food Futures project, so we were thinking about, you know, reflecting on this question. And I think um, one of the main differences is that interdisciplinary research works with a wider variety of stakeholders um, that are often in conflict, you know, or in tension. So it could be tensions in terms of uh, power imbalances, or uh, perhaps like some voices are louder than others in terms of, you know, like who has the, the in terms of decision making as well, for instance, and therefore the approaches um, to target specific cohorts or audiences, sometimes it's not the best uh, way to move forward, right? So then the, the other aspect of interdisciplinary research is that it is often linked with wicked problems, you know, problems that are complex, problems that are interconnected. So the need to facilitate dialogue among and, and negotiation among stakeholders is, is, is key in this process. And therefore we require communication strategies that are inclusive of all voices involved in the in the problem or in the issue, you know. And then when we talk about <clears throat> uh, sharing research and making it accessible for everyone, there's also the role of the researcher first to facilitate processes, but also to to create um a common language as well. So, in, for instance, uh, removing uh, jargon, you know, and be able to find a, a common language among all the stakeholders involved. So, from the experience of the Fair Food Futures project, what uh, what we did, as Kia was explaining, so our main goal in the um, in the communication strategy was basically to create a platform to showcase the experiments and visions of civic food networks in Australia and open a multi-stakeholder conversation about the policy mechanisms required to scale up and bring those visions of, of those civic food networks into you know, to real context. So we, we made sure to implement an inclusive and two-way communication approach. Um, and then it was basically kind of a blanket strategy in terms of recognizing the, the fact that there are many stakeholders involved in food systems. 
So that's why we decided first to come up with the video animation and the video animation worked as the hook, basically to draw people in, to get to know more about the project. That's why we use this kind of fun and friendly um, uh, types of illustrations. Um, and then the podcast was um, designed to be more engaging in terms of you know people getting more information, more in-depth information, more evidence about the, the findings of the project. And as Kia also mentioned, create a, a platform for different groups to get to know each other, to build trust, to build uh, partnerships and, and alliances. So that was that was our, our approach in terms of communication. And then it, it also had like um, some com key components to it. So first we decided to share background information. So about the problem and the issue at hand with, um, with clear and solid evidence. But then we also made sure to focus on the hope and the good news as well. And then uh, connecting that hope with the project, with the findings on the project, right? So there's some elements for uh, the audience to engage with that and, and perhaps be inspired to do something about it, right? Then, uh, as I was saying, interdisciplinary research involves um, um, a good number of stakeholders. So then the next step there was for us to frame change, right? So including different voices and show the different uh, visions and the different perceptions that they have to make it inclusive. And always showing different levels, you know, the local perspective and the global perspective to promote reflection among the, the stakeholders. And finally, we also made sure in the communication strategy to share um, a message to create capacity. And we also drew some elements from um, social movements theory about, uh, about uh, emotion work. So we wanted to convey messages that evoke emotions uh, in the audience so that they can take actions, actions, simple actions like join your neighborhood community garden or sign up into a community supported uh, agriculture scheme, things like that or uh, put uh, pressure on your local government to um, design food, uh, food policies, things like that. And then of course, right at the end of the communication strategy, we also made sure to provide contact uh, details for all the, the audience and the organizations involved so that they, we can support the creation of alliances. Um, and, and yeah, and then of course, organizing side events like forums and panels, like what we're doing today, which is great, uh, to continue nurturing those, those creation of partnerships. So this was just an example from the Fair Food Futures project on how we approach this, you know, this high level of interdisciplinarity and complexity in these kind of problems. And yeah, food, food systems is one of those very big um, spaces where you would really need to, to focus on that. So. I think that would be my contribution there. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to say anything about that? Yes, I can jump in, Natalie. Um, I would like to highlight what Juan just said about the importance of communicating from the very beginning uh, of this type of processes or works where everyone is, is doing. Um, I think in our, in our case, in the fishing transformation project, that was super instrumental. Uh, and uh, that uh, do not, of course, do not means that it's not important also to focus on like more traditional ways of communicating our work and our science, for example, as traditional scientific papers, that is, it's important also to, to focus. But the having the opportunity first to think in uh, communication pieces that after after at the end of the of the day are like synthesize synth synthesis of uh, what we are doing in a, in in a common language as um was previously highlighted um it's like a previous also experience for uh, academic outputs it's very helpful at least in our case thinking on communication pieces was like a stepping stone to then thinking academic outputs. And also it's a matter of timing because um, when you start with this project, you have all this energy and time and you're super emo uh, motivated with the, these processes. So you dedicate all this super positive energy 
into something that would be tangible or output that would be tangible and useful for a lot of people and uh, not uh, only on traditional ways to communicate science of, uh, for example, academic papers. And uh, something that sometimes I, I struggle with is that uh, if we try to communicate our science or our works after we convey these academic outputs, sometimes I'm like super exhaust, exhausted uh, or, uh, by the process, you know, like it has been like the research, the process of submitting a paper, one year of reviews, and then working on communication would be a, a, could be inconvenient in terms of timing. So uh, flipping this order is also very helpful to engage and to build trust in the process. So, and finally, um, one of the key issues in our project was also the possibility to gather feedbacks from participants and other actors into the, the process and to nurture the process. Uh, because that's something that it sometimes happens is that you have these uh, feedbacks after the project has been finished. And yes, it's almost like an, an anecdote, you know, like, yeah, it would be would be intelligent or strategic to implement what you're saying, but now the project is over, so we cannot do nothing. But if you are communicating during the, the process and involving different actors, you have that opportunity. And, I, and, and for me, I think that's uh, a key issue of communicating transdisciplinary science. Very good points. Anyone else like to? Uh... Yes, I can continue. First, I'd say, uh, I'd say that communication in a transdisciplinary project is crucial at different levels for mutual understanding, mutual language, as Daniel said, between stakeholders and scientists, but also it works among scientists and among stakeholders. Uh, often I say it's, it's easy to speak to journalists uh, to talk in a public conference. It's obviously not easy, but sharing results in a transdisciplinary context is even harder because you are dealing directly with people you are, who are affected, people who are committed to the project. And finally, as a researcher, you are impacted as well by, by the situation. And people, participants have higher expectation and are really concerned. So uh, when you communicate, you get a direct feedback, positive or negative emotional, instead of just a polite applause. So imagine when you are a participant, when you receive the result in which you participate, in which generally the, the project concerns you, uh, your environment, uh, your health, uh, you will be affected because it speaks about you, about your life. So you can expect to receive data. Um, you have, you can have a lot of different expectations uh, to receive data, to be able to fight, uh, to denounce, uh, to find, a, to have a direct solution, to have good news or bad news. Um, so as researcher, we 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 can't be neutral, and we therefore have a have a huge responsibility in this communication. So it's it's why in the RGO project to be able to to touch uh, as much as uh, different people as possible. We we have chosen different media, um, gra visual graphism, maps, uh, interactive objects, poster, paintings, video, podcast, theater, uh, to propose a multimedia experience. And we found that it helped to have a recognized artist in the project and really good communication, uh, really good support. To, to ensure trust and engagement uh, at local and national level, for example. Um, also, for, for example, the, the theater plays makes everyone uh, in the room love, researcher, resident, uh, Kiev. And this uh, also helped to volatilize the place of the researcher. Uh, you can be seen as uh, the only one having knowledge or uh, on being in an inaccessible. So, but what's the case in uh, our approach in, uh, in her geo project? Thank you, Melina. Juan, uh, would you like to add something? Yep. Sure, I almost jumped before Melina again, so um, something not working there for me. Um, 
we had the luxury of in this project that we had a five year project. Um, so I think the, the timeline gives you space that some of the other projects that might be shorter maybe don't have. So the way the project was designed was not in, in a linear way. First you design, then you implement the research, then you do the outreach, then you move on. So it was more a spiral design, a bit of research, engagement, outreach, then back to research, engagement, outreach. So the outreach never happened at the end. In fact, the last thing we did was the second survey of 1500 people and then analyzed it. Once we have done a lot of dissemination, we started the project with dissemination with one of the articles in the conversation. So I guess part of that transdisciplinary framing, in, in my opinion, I'm not an expert in transdisciplinary research, but part of that, part of transdisciplinary approaches also involves rethinking the way that you implement the phases and the stages of research. We were never too worried if our project was multi-inter or, or transdisciplinary. I think it was all three uh, in different stages. And uh, the transdisciplinary research, the, the challenge we put forward uh, in the intent of developing a transdisciplinary approach. I think transdisciplinary approach you know, you can read the definitions. Multidisciplinary means this, inter means that, trans means that. Everyone agrees with the distinction. You could even find a lot of coherence and synergy at the conceptual and theoretical level. Okay, let's, you know, work with systems theory or social change. Yeah. But at the level of method, that's where things go wrong. And no one wants to let go of their method most of the time. Uh, and said, yeah, I'm a multi and interdisciplinary, but, you know, we need evidence. So, you know, you can't, we cannot do storytelling, you know, indigenous storytelling, uh, because there's no evidence there. Uh, so the project was trying to challenge all the time ourselves, the stakeholders we were working with, and the youth groups we were working uh, to go to a kind of meta method approach. Uh, and, and I think that's when trans disciplinary work sometimes, and sometimes it didn't, and we needed to sort of come back to, to more traditional multi and interdisciplinary projects. Uh, but I think in, in the method is where the most of the challenges are, hence why we paid so much attention. Uh, the, the concept was quite simple. We, we didn't, you know, develop a, 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 a big theoretical you know, conceptual design behind it. Uh, uh, it was mostly focusing on inventing methods, using inventive methods, challenging methods, but also, as Ignacio was saying, relying strongly on traditional methods. We did a lot of work with ecologists and uh, doing models of climate change in the Antarctic, glaciologists who, were, who are producing absolutely crucial data to understand the future of the Antarctic and how the Antarctic is influencing these Antarctic cities, you know, through weather patterns, through fisheries, through so. Um, anyways, I think that's the the message that I coming out of of this challenging project. Sometimes it worked, most of the time it didn't work, um, and and I think it's important in all of these projects that we're working on is to have a very important strategy for measuring impact, uh, which is not just, you know, the 50,000 people that read the conversation articles. We had 150 media articles, you know, television, print in five cities. I don't think that's a measure of impact. I think impact is the change that you create in the people you're working with, whether it's the stakeholders, the communities. Um, so the, the impact of this project we are seeing, we're starting to see two years after it has fi finished, when the youth coalition of the city of Punta Arenas has acquired legal personhood, they are a legal entity, and they are engaging in the politics, in the environmental and sustainability politics of their own cities. 
when the mayors of the cities want to meet to develop a charter of Antarctic cities. So I think that the impact of trans transdisciplinary projects working across science policy and, and humanities and social sciences, sometimes one needs to design the projects to be able to measure that impact long after the project has finished. And that's the crucial problem because you don't have funding for that. You, they give you funding for six months, one year, two years, even five years, but then it's it's very difficult to measure the, the project. So we were lucky that we the method that we applied allowed things to go on to have a to for the project to have an afterlife in the cities and to be able to implement change and impact by consciously designing this transdisciplinary approach for an afterlife of the project. Sorry. Thank you, Juan. I just want to give a chance to Kia in case you wanted to add anything. If not, that's okay as well. All right. Um, so I do have a few more questions, but I encourage all of the participants to also ask your questions in the chat. We will have a chance um, to also, you can raise your hand if you have a question and you can ask directly to the group or the panelists or uh, share your experience as well. As well. Um, my next question is, um, is, is, uh, is about storytelling because in these transdisciplinary settings where we have many diverse actors involved, even when the objective is to work towards a common goal, everyone has their own interests. Not everyone is affected equally by the situation and not everyone will be affected equally by the outcome. Um, if we think of communication as storytelling, how do you decide on the narrative that's being told? And how do you navigate questions of transparency, transparency uh, objectivity and accessibility in a way that stays true to the story that's being told and also be uh, accountable to the people that are involved? Would anyone like so to? I'll, I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, look, I really, I thought I really like this question because I think for our project in Fair Food Futures, it was really about it, the, the stories were central to the research question. The stories were central to the methodology uh, in creating. In, we were creating new stories about the future of food. So I think this this question to me, you know, I I, I definitely reflect on this a lot through the study. Um, and I guess the first simple answer was to make those contested stories and the contestation and the dilemmas around whose voices to actually make that a part of the stories themselves and to not kind of take this approach as, as we're going to try to neat in the edges of, of the stories and the solutions, but to make that contestation part of them. So within our future scenarios, you know, I, on one hand, I grappled with trying to make, make each story on its own you know, make sense. And then I tried to make our four scenarios kind of be able to talk to each other in the way that we pulled the data together. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's not entirely possible. So each of those scenarios, you know, sometimes they have conflicting elements within them. In one scenario, you know, there are storylines about how technology should be used or by whom. And in another scenario, this might contradict with what we're saying about Indigenous knowledge, for example. So we tried to find ways to tell stories where those contestations were able to be part of the problem rather than uh, something that we needed to, to iron out and to take out of the storyline. So I think that that was the beauty of co-creating future scenarios in the way that we did. Um, I also think that the narratives were communicated really early on through the use of images. Uh, in our, one of our very first workshops, we actually had participants um, cut up pictures from magazines and, and use these and create their own posters. So right, and this was before we had the animation even uh, in mind. And so we had people engaging in a visual way really early on themselves. And so from those posters that they created, we then used these I shared them with the illustrator and the illustrator could then take um, aspect things that the participants were drawing themselves in, the, to, in, in those posters to then create as part of the initial um, drawings that we used. And, and what the illustrator did is she took drawings from our first workshops 
overnight or within kind of a day and created them to like a sketch of what the scenario would look like. And we took these back on in the next round of workshops. So the visual element came all the way through. And I think this really allowed the participants to decide what parts of the storyline would be included and how we would visual, um, visualize that. Um, so that, that, and that was certainly how the animation came to kind of evolve then. Um, in terms of, um, so how did we deal with conflicting interests? I think we tried to embed them in the stories and, and deal with grapple, grapple with the conflicts. Um, but we also really convened speakers and people from different perspectives on purpose so that then they could tell their own stories. And as part of that, uh, in terms of how did we grapple with, you know, who that, that accountability or, or around the story, we also really tried to make connections to the practical policy debates happening outside of the study. And I think that was a really important way to show that this wasn't just a research project that was sitting in its own kind of bubble that was happening in a research space, but that we were really engaged with these critical political discussions happening right now. So for example, in Australia right now, we're, this year we're going to be having a, a national referendum around um, recognizing indigenous peoples in the constitution. So here's some a part of the context within which our Fair Food Futures work was, was occurring. So, there were elements of, of ensuring that the narratives and the language that we were using to seek a common ground would touch point onto these bigger political discussions. Um, similarly, we were making sure that the language in those storylines were touching points with what health practitioners are talking about in terms of sustainable diets or what um, food activists on the ground are talking about when they talk about radical degrowth. So we tried to kind of make those connections with theoretical and practical ideas that people were working with at the moment. Um, in terms of that objectivity question, Natalie, really quickly, I guess as a sociologist working in interpretive sociology, I disagree that science, any type of science is inherently objective um, and that we need to be transparent somehow about our objectivity. I think it goes the other way around. I think as scientists engaged in transdisciplinary research, we need to acknowledge that we are subjective actors who are able to set research questions, who are able to draw on a lot of theoretical frameworks already and methods to apply, but that we need to then kind of break that open for the participants in our research to be able to then co-design the types of methods that best fit what they would like to do when they get in the room to participate in our research. Um, so, you know, if we're seeing research as a form of social action, to be done in collaboration with the people who are most affected by the research problem or the outcomes, then this then really puts the onus on the researcher to be to contribute to positive social change and to be transparent about that as the objective, I think, about a normative objective to contribute to social change. And that's what transparency should be about, um, rather than sort of some kind of objective science that's separated. And certainly all of these projects we heard today don't do that. They're all co-creating, um, co-creating problem definitions, co-creating problem solutions. Yeah, stop there. Yeah, if I, I may add as well. So I think that also has to do a lot with um, the issue of research ethics as well and the role of um, self-reflection and positionality uh, as a researcher, right? So more from a like individual perspective. So because when we're doing research, I mean, research is also politically charged. And mostly when we're talking about uh, problems that are, you know, like, a, um, you know, in the social, social ecological dimension where there are uh, social, economic, political, it's very difficult for us as researchers to not really take a stance, right? So then if we are working in interdisciplinary communication projects, I think there's there should be there a commitment, an ethical commitment from our side to make sure that we're including all the voices, right? Because we may be drawn into just showing the voices that we think would need to be heard, right? Uh, could be because we feel more aligned with those communities that are marginalized and perhaps we won't be including uh, government voices, right? Or it could be the other way around. So it's about the, this invitation about re, being really critical about our own biases. I think this is this is key, and then in that way we'll be able to 
um, show um, all the narratives involved and in, in really engage in a, this process of co-design, but from a, from build, building a, a platform of of a shared dialogue and um, yeah, and in transparency, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, can I say something? Yes, sure. Yeah, uh, I'm audible. It's a bit hard to hear you. You're a bit quiet. Yeah. So we are doing a similar project here in India uh, in a small hill town, which is uh, known as Dharamsala, where the Dalai Lama himself lives. And this place is quite active from, you know, from climate change point of view. Mm -hmm. And in the last some four or five years, we have a lot of landslides and heavy rain and then, the, you know, uh, small to medium range earthquake. So what we started, we started, you know, uh, looking into how, you know, small media outlets, you know, they cover climate change stories here in this small hill town. And we found some very quiet, you know, interesting observations. It is all about, you know, what people talk about climate change. It is not about what media talks about climate change, but it is what local people, they talk about climate change, how they look at it and what, what they think, what they have, what, what kind of information they have, what is missing there. And, uh, we have started, you know, exploring communication, you know, as an outreach and as an advocacy, you know, tool. And in last one year, we have some very interesting, you know, insights from the local community uh, because they have a very different way of looking at climate change. Uh, and, and unfortunately, that is something which is not been reported in media. And that is what Daniel says, that these small narratives, they are very, very important. They are very important if you really want to, you know, look into the role of community, what, what community, actu actually how community look into it, then we must have an idea that what are these small narratives. So I hope that, you know, focus would also be on, you know, small communities, indigenous communities, and the way they, you know, discuss, they debate, they contest climate change. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Lorenzo, would you like to ask the question yourself? Sure, thank you. Well, first, thanks to all the speakers, the wonderful presentations. Uh, listening to the last part of uh, what you were of your presentations, I was wondering because is it really possible to include all voices when we are uh, working in co-production? Uh, what I mean is, uh, if we're uh, trying to address issues like social justice, environmental justice, uh, is it uh, really possible to dialogue with agribusiness stakeholders, for instance, and um, uh, agroecological producers? Um, how do we deal with conflict? And if, I mean, if, if we really, I mean, is it mandatory to include all voices? Or in fact, it's actually the, our political and ethical engagement implies for us to take a stand. Great question. Does anyone want to respond? Uh, yeah. I can try. Uh, we have a lot of different stories, different narratives with many points of not all, but a lot of, and carried by different media. And I really think that makes our approach so rich. But we we have to find, um, uh, our goal is to find a balance between all these stories and the ethics of the project. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, working of, uh, at the beginning of the project on our ethic. And uh, the project ethics is not to just uh, um, communicate about uh, tools for denunciation, but uh, to foster productive dialogue and finding solutions. If I take an example, if we give uh, environmental data to, to fight again uh, a factory, uh, it could be a solution. But uh, what we aim is to also offer a reflection of what would be the consequences. For example, if the factory moves to a poor location with fewer 
environmental uh, guidelines. The factory leaves, but the pollution stays with no one to take account for it. So um, it's really important to, uh, to, to offer a voice to hold, but to, to, to have a reflection of, uh, of uh, the, the purpose. And in our case, the role of uh, mediators, local mediators, young volunteers is really important because they translate in their house, in their own way, the, the purpose. And sometimes as a researcher, we, we have to let it go. Sometimes in, even in Wolof, the, the local language, we recognize that they are not communicating what we agreed on. And in fact, that adapt, uh, they had up the, the message to the audience that they know better than us. And they transform a narrative and finally narratives change along the dissemination event. And I think that is really interesting because finally it's the base of the co-construction uh, uh, of the narratives. And uh, it's leading to new concepts in an interactive way. So I don't have a, a clear solution, but we, we are trying. Ignacio. Yes, thank you for this very important question. And we, um, struggle to try to find an answer in our project to this uh, particular challenge of uh, um, how to involve all relevant actors without compromising um, those uh, voices that were already historically marginalized uh, in, in small-scale fishers in Uruguay. So one thing uh, that we decided, and this also relates was uh, Daniel uh, told uh, recently is about this the uh, decisions as uh, we took as researchers uh, to, for example, bound the space and the people that would participate in this space on the transformative space we were aimed to establish, and and for example, we decided to not include governmental actors in these first steps because. Uh, we thought that it could be an inhibiting factor for a lot of people to express their thoughts and feel safe in this space of, for collaboration. So this is, of course, this is not a, a recipe uh, that will work in every, in every setting, but um, I think we, we need to be super transparent about this. And, and in our case, it was a decision that we took uh, like consciously um, but we tried uh, over time to broaden this space and try to include uh, another actors that could have uh, like major impacts in terms of power dynamics uh, within this type of groups. Uh, notwithstanding that, of course, there's a power dynamics within the group already established because there's researchers, fishers, gastronomers, not the same but uh, there's a, some certain type of factors that could have like a disproportionate effect into the participation of, of particular um, participants. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe um, related with the, with the previous question about how we build this story in a narrative and how we manage like contrasting uh, perception or, or ideas in this transdisciplinary works, I think it's very important to leverage con uh, conflicts, like or, or at least not major conflict, but this like tiny conflict could be instrumental to to advance. And for example, when we were building this um, visions of the futures, we decided to include this uh, constructing uh, constructing or these conflicting images of the future within a single vision, because in that uh, sense, uh, people that could not be to entirely agree with certain type of elements of these visions, at least could agree with another element of the vision. So this act as, a, as a, an object that could connect different and divergent uh, type of um, perceptions or visions of the future. So I think that conflicts is something that we can leverage. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Can I just quickly, briefly build on that? Um, and as an example from our project, um, in terms of, you know, 
uh, and to answer the question before around, you know, is it does it make sense to have everybody being all of the voices? And I would say no, you don't need, you definitely don't have to have all of the voices in the room. I'm just thinking an example from our food pro our project was around the role of food charities, particularly the large national food charities who are very closely connected with the supermarket system, and uh, we saw that, and and this was like uh, it was kind of an ongoing, a bit of a source of tension in the project and tension in the workshops and when people were discussing about the role of food charities and you had food charities themselves being part of that discussion. So that was really, um, I think that was a really nice example of how stakeholders who were really differently positioned in terms of power within the food system were then able to actually talk about what the future of food charities might look like within these other types of scenarios that were being other elements of the same scenario that were being envisaged. So we would, I would agree with Ignacio in terms of how do you hold these elements that might be in tension from stake voices of different stakeholders who might be in tension, but actually in our project, it was really quite creative. And we, we ended up with quite a strong storyline that would talk about how in the future food system, food charities moved away from being kind of an emergency response to food and so connected with a retailing system to really be key actors that connect across different social movements, for example, for poverty, for climate and for food justice. So it, it brought some new creative ways of thinking about where would food charities be in a future food system? And if they weren't there in the room, I think it might have been much more easy to, um, to step aside and say, well, food charities don't have a place to a role to play. Thank you. Any other reactions, comments? Yes, Raki. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this insightful uh, discussion and for the presentations. Um, I, I tend to agree with Kia in that um, it's it would be very difficult to take into consideration all of the actors um, involved because each each one would have different opinions on how to uh, how to proceed how uh, to proceed with system trans system thinking transformations. Um, and there was there was an earlier comment that I that I also hung on to was, you know, in in terms of um, of transformations, there's uh, policies in in the develop in the developed world world work um, work very well, um, you know. But when you come from a developing world, we have so many other different problems uh, that the implementation of those policies um, become very difficult on the ground, um, you know. Um, so, so yeah, uh, different different actors would would um, would have uh, different agendas. So uh, it becomes very challenging in that. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Any other last uh, reactions or comments about that uh, topic? If not, we have a question from Joseph that uh, was in the chat. Joseph, do you want to ask your question yourself? I can just try to sum up his question then. And I think what he's asking is uh, if you could give some uh, tips on the best approach for communicating research. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Joseph. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to attend this meeting. It's quite exciting and I'm very excited on what I'm hearing. So for those who might not know what I do, I'm a research scientist from Space Weather Science. So my question is, if, if, you, if, if you're working in an area that is quite new to the community, uh, but it's really impacting on what they do, uh, but like you, you have very low human resource on this and stakeholders themselves are not aware of this new thing you are doing, what are some of the best communication pathways that someone can pick? I work, for instance, in space weather. Space weather is a big issue on low latitude regions like Kenya, where I come from. 
But at times when I approach even the aviation authorities and all that, they are shocked. We know about it, but we don't think we should care about it. You know. So what are the best approaches you can do to bring this community or to this new area, but is seriously impacting on their day-to-day operation? -day Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Do we have any advice for Joseph from the panelists or the other? Yes, Juan. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Joseph. I, I, I do not have advice um, and just a comment. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, part of the answer is that it would be risky for anyone to give up a tip on communication communicating research output without knowing the community. I think that part of the answer lies in the specificity of the community that you are thinking of, working in, living in, coming from. So <clears throat> I don't think there's a panacea that you can say, you know, this is the tip and just apply it to any community. The local context would be critical. So that's part of the answer. In my experience, when I was working more as a communication researcher many years ago um, through a network called Our Media, which is community media, we used to uh, an approach that sometimes worked quite well, which was around shared values workshops. So the workshops were with a range in political, cultural, social, or because the topic was really new. Uh, the workshops were uh, designed to see what were the shared values that the community members had around these issues and where were the differences and try to build from the shared values first as a way to address the differences or the um, um, areas where there was not uh, in, enough knowledge, as you put in your in your question. So uh, I don't have an answer or any tip, but I, I think that would be the two points that I wanted to raise. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, maybe I can jump in also to complement uh, some of the ideas already raised by Juan. Um, I completely agree that there's no recipe or tips that are could be generalizable for every setting. But first of all, I would say that knowing the group or the community where, where you're working and what are the expectations and motivations for them to be engaged in this kind of transdisciplinary project is critical. Um, in, in, in our case, like having individual conversations beforehand, and uh, well before any workshop was carried out, was instrumental to try to understand and uh, navigate all the diversity of actors that would later be part of the project and kind of knowing what they expect of this uh, type of, of collaborations would uh, was very, very, very important. And um, other thing that, for me was a, a, a super important lesson is that um, as we were working with a small scale fisheries sectors, this, um, this sector in Uruguay was very used to, to participate in a lot of conversation or forums in, in like very traditional ways, you know, like expositions, conversations and so on. And uh, we try to be uh, innovative in the way we approach these workshops for envisioning uh, desirable futures. And instead of approaching from a, like a more traditional way, we use art-based approaches and we, we use the collage techniques technique to try to um, spark and democratize creativity within the group. And, I was quite skeptical at the beginning of how this could work. And a lot of participants were skeptical as well when they uh, initiate this uh, collaboration. But at the end of the, of the day, it was quite magical to see how uh, a lot of fishes that were very skeptical at the beginning were like completely amazed about the process and the results uh, they achieved. So, Maybe one um, 
insight uh, from our case is that don't be afraid of innovative methods or things that you may think that could be uh, not to totally suitable to some context. You may be surprised how it could end it up. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any other question from the audience or panelists? If not, maybe we can just end with a last question um, from me. <laughs> um, so as researchers, communication is not really something that is traditionally part of the training. Uh, and besides publishing papers or policy briefs and that sort of thing. So you all came up with very innovative and creative uh, methods to communicate your research. Did you find that it was difficult to engage with these activities and come up with these ideas? Or perhaps did you find it freeing to be able to finally express this creative side and integrate it into your research? Well, sorry, Kia, you go first. Sure, I was, th thanks, okay. Um, yeah, I, I personally, I did find it really, uh, I found it really creative and um, freeing. I mean, my research has always been based in participatory action research where we use a lot of visual methods and uh, anyway, but I think that what um, the methodology, before we even got to these kind of communications, outputs um, in terms of building that more, you know, using the visual art as a way to, I really love that term around democratizing creativity. That's really great. Um, and for me, it was pushing the boundaries of what I, what I knew or, or pushing the boundaries and then thinking about how would I uh, communicate this back to my academic audience, I think as actually sitting with me is probably the biggest challenge. Uh, now, I think communicating in this way back to the participants of this study and around the policy debates and the more public debate um, has been the has been really fulfilling, but in some ways a, a, a less complicated kind of aim to achieve. It's how to then kind of put this back into the academic setting and communicate it back in terms of this is, um, you know, I'm thinking of looking at the question that's in the chat about um, transforming our own scientific systems. So for me, that's a really big part of the challenge, how then to take these methods that we've used and the types of outputs like a podcast or an animation, and how do I communicate that back to the academic discipline um, as something that's actually really a new, uh, an important form of knowledge. Yeah. Juan, you had a comment. Yeah, no, I wanted to say how interesting uh, your questions have been, Natalie. And in my journey, I've been sort of traveling the on the opposite direction. My PhD is in communication. Uh, my background is in anthropology. So my work with science and scientists has come as a way of, you know, engaging with, you know, in an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. So I think the big mistake uh, well, the first one, as you say, Natalie, the scientists are not trained in communication. And when they are, uh, they are very mistrained uh, by not really understanding the very important, nuanced, but very important distinction between dissemination, information, and communication. They're very different, the three of them. Dissemination is a one-way um, flow of data, you know, this is the research, and then you push it out. And most of the time, who cares who's reading, engaging, and how are you changing? Information you want to inform, but communication is quite a profound two-way dialogue, three-way dialogue, multi-way dialogue that is quite much more complex. So all the projects that you heard today, I think were quite successful in moving beyond dissemination and information and working at the level of true communication, participatory communication, co-design. I, th I think that's one thing that has been missing in science training. The other one, uh, going back to your earlier question that I was tempted to answer, but I, th I don't want to open a big kind of worms with storytelling uh, and responding to Florencia's uh, question about whether all voices need to be counted. And 
I agree with, with the previous responses. In our Antarctic cities project, we didn't include the voice of the military, for instance. I refused to include the voice of the military. Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa don't have a military presence in the Antarctic, only some logistics, but Chile and Argentina do. And I think that imaginary that the military bring, I didn't want included in the project. So some people will say, well, you didn't include all voices and all stakeholders. I don't care, you know, it's a, it's an imaginary that I don't think it's important for how the cities are reinventing themselves around sustainability, peace, and international, um, transnational connection. And with, with storytelling is something that, just like communication, it's poorly understood in the sciences. And I think it's a tricky question. I think that, um, sorry, uh, Pradeep, uh, got somewhere there around the how the power dynamics, uh, political power dynamics shape information and communication, and and that's right. And um, there's a method that two British um, researchers came out a couple of years ago that I, I think it's interesting looking at called story listening. And they say story uh, telling is super important, but it's one part of the equation, and story listening is the other part. And discerning narrative evidence from the story you're listening is really important. That's how we break the, the circle, the cycle of fake news, for instance, being able to discern, you know, through story listening. So they say storytelling is very important. Story listening is uh, as important to gather narrative evidence, the evidence in narratives, and complement and strengthen rather than distort other forms of evidence, including science, but also including, for instance, indigenous ways of knowledge, which is an area where I work. There was a huge controversy in New Zealand last year, or the last two years, which you may have heard, when the New Zealand government and some universities wanted to introduce Matauranga science, Maori science, in the curriculum alongside traditional science. So students in schools and universities will get the traditional Western science, whether whatever the science was, but also to alongside Matauranga science. And it became a political dispute uh, of many scientists saying science is not colonial, colonialist per se. You know, there might be some colonial scientists, but science is neutral and it's, you know, anyone can do science. Um, so anyways, I don't want to you know, stay for too long, but there was a huge controversy about calling Mautaranga Maori science storytelling and storytelling as a less important way of understanding, describing, explaining the world than traditional science. And I think that's where we have a problem. I know how important it is for scientists to communicate the science properly to avoid fake news and skepticism, for instance, about climate change. I totally support that. I think we all here are. But I think there needs to be an understanding of the limits of science as a hegemonic form of knowledge that dismisses storytelling as something that doesn't have narrative evidence. Here in Australia, there are stories of climate change going back 13,000 years old that have been proven by scientists that are very close you know, to the evidence of climate change and are embedded in stories. So anyways, I just wanted to say that your two questions, Natalie, are absolutely crucial um, for, the, for this work that we're all trying to grapple with. Thank you very much, Juan. Ignacio. Yes, Natalie, only to provide a small reflection about this uh, dissonance between uh, academic uh, pathways and all this transformation research that, that involves engaging transdisciplinary work and communicating. I think that for those who are navigating a academic program or those who are uh, involved in universities, uh, there's a barrier in, in terms of the, um, the incentives of the system to publish and uh, the, our intrinsic motivations to engage into transdisciplinary collaborations that take time. And of course, I'm 
are time consuming and but are also very uh how to say like for me it was like very in, in, uh, like a very a huge source of inspiration for my work so even though it was uh perhaps not um super beneficial in academic terms in the short term in the in like in one or two years period of time i'm super sure that it would be beneficial also for my academic um pathway in the following years um so i think that even that that the dissonance could be uh, evident there's a, like a, a, another layer um, that uh, is also there and and i think building and uh, these collaborations and these networks of uh, different um, collaborators and participants will at the end of the day paid off into uh, our academics pathways so i definitely recommend for those that are starting or in, interested in establishing this type of transdisciplinary collaboration so invest time and really engage into these settings because it will pay it off thank you very much ignacio and it's true there is a commitment and an investment uh, which we don't always have that time uh, as researchers so it's something that we actively have to um, engage in I want to give um, the last chance because we're running out of time, but last chance to Daniel or and or Melina, do you have anything to add on the last uh, few questions? And yes, I can add that uh, I, I agree. Really, it's time, but it's the main main obstacle to to do outreach activities, and it takes time. Work out uh, require training, but sometimes we don't have preparation. Um, at the detriment of the time spent writing publication or do research work. And sometimes with political recognition, even though it's part of our research mission, at least in France. But um, nowadays, there are new journals such as in my scientific community, like uh, geoscience communication, that now makes it possible to valorize uh, this is experience. And I see that uh, motivates my colleagues as well. So, as Jill and Ignacio said it's um, this work is really motivating and it's bring a lot of joy and hope in, at least for me in my research. Great way to end the forum. Thank you so much to our panelists for such a rich uh, and interesting discussion uh, and to the participants as well for your attention. And I will hand it back over to my colleague Jill for a very exciting uh, announcement. Thank you, Natalie. But I thought you were doing an announcement, this exciting yeah. announcement. I don't want to uh, steal your thunder. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, so we have heard from uh, the panelists who many of them have been awardees of the Pathways Communication Grant. And we are very excited to announce that uh, there will be another round opened now. And uh, the you can learn about it. I think uh, Stephanie will add that. Um, link in the chat so you can learn about the communication grant program uh, and apply. The deadline will be 31st of October. So we really encourage you to apply for that. Um, I know there's not a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, funding that exists to encourage this type of um, research and this type of uh, communication outreach. So it is there for you. And uh, back to you, Jin. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nancy. So yeah. Um, just like uh, Natalie just uh, said before the, the this announcement, um, I also want to thank everyone who participated in this webinar for for the critical uh, all the critical reflections and insights that uh, that you provided on some of the challenges, but also on the power of communication and how that can contribute to transformative processes. Uh, I think, as uh, Juan uh, pointed out, uh, its communication is uh, still often misconceived and misunderstood. And so I think uh, it's really uh, great to have uh, uh, discussions like these. Uh, of course, special thanks to uh, our speakers today, Kia, Daniel, Ignacio, Melina, and Juan. And I encourage all of the participants to go learn more about the project that were presented as part of the session. Uh, 
uh, fair food futures, fishing transformation, air geo and Antarctic cities. Uh, the links have been provided in the chat uh, during the session. And for those of you who will be watching this webinar in the future on our website, uh, the links will also be featured underneath the video. Speaking of the website, um, if you want to watch uh, the recording of this session, or if you want to catch up on other Pathways Forum recordings, they are available on the Pathways uh, webpage. So be sure to uh, visit the, our website to, uh, to uh, share and uh, watch some of our uh, videos. Lastly, I would like uh, to inform you that if you want to stay informed of the Pathways Initiative activities, you can uh, subscribe to our Pathways newsletter. You can also follow us on Mastodon and Twitter. And Stephanie is probably providing links to all of these in the in the chat, chat box as I as I'm uh, speaking. And with this, I want to conclude by thanking you all once again. Uh, we're going to take a short break in the Pathways Forum during the the North Hemisphere summer, but we'll be back uh, probably in September um, for more uh, engaging and exciting discussions uh, in the sphere of transformative research. Thank you, everyone. And until we see each other again, take care.